Welcome to Fundamentals for Startups, a Comotion Labs production. My name is Caroline Hansen, and I am manager of Startup Hall, Comotion Labs Tech Incubator. If you've joined us before, you know that Comotion Labs is a multi-industry incubator host hosting early stage startups from both inside and outside the University of Washington community. We are committed to nurturing and enabling the success of our startups contributing critical infrastructure and opportunities for learning, mentoring, and networking. We have three incubators in two locations on campus, Life Sciences and Hardware in Fluke Hall, and Tech here in Startup Hall. If you are a founder looking for a community to help your startup grow and flourish, we'd love to talk to you. This event, Fundamentals for Startups, is a regular lecture series open to anyone interested in learning about entrepreneurship, or building a startup. Every week we bring in experts with diverse perspectives and experiences to share insights, inspire action, and offer space for questions. All the fundamentals for startup presentations are archived on our YouTube channel and on our Comotion website where you can filter by topic. To learn about and register for future fundamentals events, visit Comotion Labs online and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Today, I'm excited to introduce Tia Over, Inter Executive Vice President and Chief Operations Officer at Spring Green Communications. Tia is a public relations executive and thought leader who has led messaging strategy for NASA. Today, Tia will explain why you need to know your own story, how to articulate your mission and vision and the importance of getting everyone on the team fluent in key messages. She'll outline the information you need to gather and initial steps to take to compose a story that sells. Welcome, Tia. Hi. Would you, mind, would you take that with you? That'll leave some space. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming on such a beautiful Friday afternoon. Uh, I'm Really honored that you would take time out of your busy week toward the end of it and spend it with me here. Um, it's a joy to be in this awesome space. Uh, I was familiar with your old building, and so it's great to be in here, and I'm looking forward to the tour later, Donna, so I'm taking you up on that. Um, you know, I spend most of my time on campus at the UW Tower. I've been uh, privileged to support UW Continuum College, the university's professional and continuing education arm for the last seven years or so. Thank you, Rowena, for coming. Um, so I'm not a stranger to campus, but I, I'm new to this space. Um, and uh, Donna O'Neill, I mentioned you just briefly, but I wanted to say thank you so much for um, recommending Spring Green to speak here today. Um, Donna was an incredible mentor to me years ago when we worked at We Communications on the Microsoft account there. We've got some stories. Um, and so thank you so much, um, too, for being here. So today we're going to spend some time considering what needs to be in your startup story. There are numerous nuances and levels to storytelling, but today I'm going to give you tips for creating a story you can tell about the company you've built or are building. So keep your mindset there. And I've selected this image of an astronaut exploring the surface of a planet, maybe it's Mars. Um, but what I like about this image is that it's almost as if you can see the explorer thinking, what is this thing I've discovered? What do I know about it? And what does it mean to me? And how am I going to explain it when I get back home? And so much about communication, storytelling, and business starts there. Starts with asking those questions. But before we get too far into it, I'd like to take a moment to tell you a bit about me and my story. So this is my family. We live in Portland, so I drove up last night. I spend a plenty of time in the Seattle area. I used to live here, but Portland is home. Um, I have been with Spring Green Communications going on 14 years. Um, my business partner, Melissa Matthews, founded the company 15 years ago. We were former colleagues at NASA Headquarters Public Affairs in Washington, D.C. And uh, we really felt like creating something that was fully flex, fully remote, which in today's day and age is not novel, but it was a little bit back then, um, would give people who live different lifestyles and live abroad, as she does, her husband's in the state with the State Department. 
um, give, give people opportunities to still do meaningful work. And so today I manage operations and business development for the company and I also lead our higher ed accounts, both Continuum College and uh, we work with a cosmetics regulation expert out of Fordham Law in New York. Um, I already mentioned we communications with Donna, but um, my heritage has really always been between NASA and Microsoft and now the type of um, enterprise uh, engineering and higher ed clients we have today is bringing storytelling skills and strong communications counsel to people who live more on the left side of the brain than I do. Um, I'm not a Husky by training, but I uh, had some great experience at Winfield University down in McMinnville, Oregon, studying communications and political science. All right, so let's get into it. Today, um, I'm really gonna focus with you on three buckets I want you to fill as you think about building out your company's narrative. And those are the audience, authenticity, and action. We're gonna define what we mean when we say audience and talk about some fundamentals around storytelling. We're going to get into the nitty gritty, like the meat of your story, which is everything that should be in the messaging toolkit that you build out. And then we're gonna talk about putting that stuff into action, because what good is building a communication strategy and plan if you don't use it? And then we'll leave some time for your questions. Okay, so if you only remember three, time, three things about our time together today, I hope it is that you can take into consideration the audience, the authenticity about the things you say and claim, and the action that you're gonna take with it. These are the things that really give lift to your story. And when you're telling a story, the place to start, like I said at the beginning, is to ask yourself, who am I talking to? Who is listening? Knowing your audience is really critical. And for most of you, when you think of audience, you probably think of your end users and your, your customers. Um, that is true. But there are other times where a VC investor or a go-to-market partner, or even a member of the media, if you're fortunate to sit down for an interview, um, they're your audience in that moment and tailoring your content to them. That's the critical first step and it's one that seems kind of like a no-brainer, but it very often gets overlooked. So once you know who your audience is and what, um, what they need to hear, um, the question is, what do you want them to do with the information you have to share? Are you asking them to buy a product that you've built? Are you asking them to adopt a behavior? Maybe change a system? Say that. Be very clear about your call to action for them. Um, so I'm a big sports junkie. Uh, I have various random sports allegiances, which I can talk to you about at, offline if you're interested, but um, I'm really into the Bill Simmons podcast right now. And he had, uh, the other day, he had the co-founder of Bleacher Report, Dave Finocchio, on, and they were talking about a new venture that, that Dave is doing. And they got into this whole dialogue around audience, and it, my ears perked up, and I wanted to bring you this one quote specifically that really um, backs up this, this point. Dave said, we're in an era of media where niche really matters. You need to build something that really solves a problem for an audience. And it's hard to be all things to all people. So really focus on one thing, do it super, super well, matter to an audience. I can't say it any better myself, audience matters. Okay, so now I'd like to take us back to the seven literary elements of storytelling that you probably learned in high school lit class or at some other point along the way in school. Um, these shouldn't look unfamiliar to you, but I think, again, when we're thinking about the fundamentals of storytelling, so often I see, I see companies not remember what the audience is looking for when they're listening to a story, whether it's that they're opening a book or starting their you know, stream, favorite streaming show on their iPad or sitting down at a Broadway show. They might not be conscious of it, but they're all looking for plot, tone, theme, setting, conflict, characters, and point of view. And I really wanna to focus today on these last three, conflict, characters, and point of view, because I think these are the places where businesses should focus their storytelling. 
Okay, so conflict. Um, I mentioned at my, when, when Donna and I worked at Wagner Edstrom, which it was called when we worked there, now it's We Communications, um, we were on the Microsoft account. And we were fortunate to be there at a time where both founders, Melissa Wagner Zorkin and Pam Edstrom were there. Melissa is still there, um, Pam has since passed. But um, I, Donna, you'll probably remember this, at the beginning of any meeting that um, Pam would come into on the Microsoft account, she'd ask the question, what's the business problem we're trying to solve? What is the business problem we're trying to solve? We're communicators, and so we're coming at the problem with communications, but you're all dealing with that every day in terms of the solutions you're building. So starting with conflict and really dr drilling down and making clear to your audience the problem that your product or solution solves. That's worth doing. Then as we think about the characters um, in the story, everybody loves a good protagonist, antagonist story. You know, you've got Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader, you've got Barbie and Ken, or Barbie and the Patriarchy, however you want to translate that movie. Um, and making sure that your, your company is positioned as the protagonist in the story. Um, more often than not, the antagonist might be your competitor set, but it could be things like government regulations or other kind of factors that are inhibiting you from getting into the marketplace. And then the third point of view. Um, I, re I really like to think of this as the ways you differentiate yourself from the competition as well as your value proposition, which we'll get into in a moment. But all of these things, defining the conflict you're going to solve with your product or solution, articulating your characters, and having a point of view, they all require that you have a wealth of data to back up your claims. So definitions and examples, data and statistics, testimonials and endorsements. These are the meat on the bones of your story that you need to have at your disposal while you're crafting it. Um, and I'll tell you that once you get to the point with your companies as they flourish, where you're able to bring in third parties, um, be that a PR agency or um, a, an advertising agency, People like me are going to, that's one of the first things we're gonna ask for, is where are all of your proof points? Where's all the stuff that I can use to create this narrative for you or to bolster your narrative? So it's really important that you have that with you along the way. Um, I actually was gonna read an excerpt from a book that I left in my briefcase in the back, so I'm gonna skip, skip that step um, but I, I am reading right now um, an awesome book by Rick Rubin. Has anyone read uh, The Creative Act, A Way of Being? Isn't it so good? Um, so there's a chapter in there entitled Seeds, and he, he talks about how important it is just to collect information as you go and to not really be discriminating about what it is and then find ways to use it later. So um, if you want to come see me afterward, I can show, point out that point in the book for you, but it's fantastic read, and it's really inspiring for people no matter what type of work you're in. All right, so now we're gonna dive into the messaging toolkit that I think all of you should endeavor to have, and some of you may already have some of these things. Um, how many of you already have a value proposition or an elevator pitch, let's say? Awesome, cool start. Um, so these are the things that I recommend any company have and use as they um, are building their source material because everything you put out into the world in written and spoken form should have a consistent narrative. Um, it not only holds you kind of accountable to the things that you're working toward, but it gives your audience clarity around, oh yeah, that's what they said they're gonna deliver. I want that. So you could have a whole bunch of different tools in your messaging toolkit, uh, but these four is where, is where I would start. Your value, preposi value proposition details what your company offers and what they should, why they should choose you. Your mission statement details your objectives as an organization. It addresses your purpose, goals, and values. And I'll share a few examples in a moment of both value props and mission statements. Your key messages, these are, first of all, so fun to write, I think, it's like my favorite thing to do. Um, but it's really important that they're bite size, they're memorable, that they're really the main points of what you're bringing to market and the value that you deliver. 
And then an elevator pitch. This is really the answer to the question, what do you do? Um, if you're not familiar with the term, it gets its name from the idea that you step into an elevator with someone and if you only have the time to ride in the elevator, what are you gonna say about your role or about your company? So it really kind of forces you to be concise and um, I also love concision in communications. Okay, so let's dive into the value proposition again a bit. Um, a value proposition, like I said, details what your company offers to customers and why they should choose you. So where to start when you're drafting your own? You want to first identify your customer's main problem. Most of you have likely done that already. You wanna identify the benefits that your product offers. And then this third step is one that maybe you haven't done yet. That's to map the value of your benefits back to your customer's problem, making that really clear. And then if you can, make a claim around differentiation. I say that this is a nice have, not a must have, um, because there are some value props, including the two I'm about to show you, that I don't think do that. Don't spend too much time doing that, but it's always a great thing when you can set yourself apart. So the first value proposition I'm gonna share is from Morby Parker. Theirs is, buying eyewear should leave you happy and good looking with money in your pocket. Glasses, sunglasses, and contacts. We've got your eyes covered. Covers the customer's pain point, how you're gonna solve it. The next is from Slack. Slack is a place where your team comes together to collaborate. Important information can be found by the right people, and your tools pipe in information when and where you need it. Cool, I'm a customer, that sounds good to me. So sometimes these terms can get a little like, wait, what's the difference between these things? So I, I found this um, graphic from HubSpot and I thought I'd share it because it helped me even um, delineate between the two. So a value proposition um, details what you offer customers and why they should choose you. It's really customer centric. Whereas your mission statement details your objectives as an organization. It's really more about you. So they are complementary, but they are not the same thing. And I think it's important to kind of note that and have that in your mind as you're working on one. Um, I'll just note here before we move into mission statement that at Spring Green Communications, we're seeing a real uptick in um, interest in employee value propositions, EVPs. And as your companies grow, that's something that you might wanna consider investing some time in. Um, an EVP really answers the question for employees, what's in it for me? And it gives people reasons to want to work for you versus for another company. So it helps with recruiting and retention. And um, it's just another spin on a value prop, something to file away. Okay, so the mission statement is your why. It defines who you are and where you're headed. It reflects your values. And a couple of examples that you've probably seen before, quite familiar, um, are Microsoft's. Our mission is to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. The primary mission of the University of Washington is the preservation, advancement, and dissemination of knowledge. Pretty clear. They're lofty by design. They're meant to give people like a North Star. And they're not meant to stifle or limit your potential, but it does provide that direction you're headed and reflects your values. So kind of keep it at that level. Okay, so we have ticked through the first two items in the uh, messaging toolkit. Can anybody remember what the third is? A little pop quiz, keep you on your toes. Action. <gasps> Action is great. That is like the next bucket we're gonna move into after authenticity, but Yes, key messages, well done, well done. Okay, so key messages are the words to say. You're prepared for any conversation when you have these in the back of your head. They help you and your team make sure you're all singing from the same music. Consistent, confident, and clear information. And they should really contain what you offer, who you serve, what's unique about you, ways to partner with you, and calls to action. Then there's always the question, well, what do I do once I have these key messages? And my answer is use them everywhere, all the time, on repeat. Um, they should show up in responses to RFPs, 
If you're building any collateral for a trade show or you know a job fair or or anything, they should show up there. Um, if you are fortunate to afford some digital ads, pull those key messages out and reuse them in the ads. They should be created into talking points for when in preparation for sitting down for a media interview or for a, a VC meeting. Um, if you're going to do public speaking engagements, use your key messages. Social media posts, website, you get it, right? Like the point in putting this exhaustive lift, lift, list up here isn't to bore you. It's to say um, use, use, reuse, and of course adapt them to the to the audience. Going back to audience, um, but don't let them just sit on a shelf. If you've built these things, put them to work. Okay, so you is it you that said you had an elevator pitch? That's great. I'm not going to ask you to, to say it. Don't worry. Um, but I, I, an elevator pitch uh, is, is one of those things that I um, get all giddy and excited about because I think, um, first of all, it, it really just puts your messaging to work for you and gives you that confidence when you're going into a networking meeting or an interview or whatever that you know something that you can say that certainly you want to have rehearsed enough to where it comes off as natural, but um, that really represents what you do or what your company delivers. Um, so it should reflect your mission and values, obviously. It needs to be memorable and conversational in tone. Not so detailed that it can't be adapted to whatever conversation you're having. So you really want it to be something where it's like, okay, I know I wanna kind of express these key points. And sometimes you can say it verbatim and it works. Um, other times, you know, you might need to adapt it a little bit. But it, the key part of an elevator pitch, and this is something I think a lot of people don't consider, is that you want it to leave whoever you're talking with wanting to know more about you. You don't want to just, you know, bludgeon them with in words to where then they're not interested in finding out, well, how do they do that? Or how could we partner? Or do they do this specific type of communications work? Um, give them enough, but not everything. So I, um, found this great clip from Patrick Deng. He's a sales coach and he's got a YouTube channel that's worth checking out if you haven't already. So he has um, this, this equation that he's come up with. It's X, Y, and Z. And he says if you fill out the equation that that gives you your first sentence of your elevator pitch. Um, I help X achieve Y by doing Z. And it's, again, it's pretty fundamental, but it's a great place to start. It makes crafting an elevator pitch a lot less daunting. And um, I'm happy to share the link afterward if you'd like to go back and watch it. Um, sure, it's um, spelled, let me just get it here. It's Patrick Dang, D-A-N-G. And um, like I said, he's a sales coach, and so he doesn't just work with um, startups, but he works with kind of everyone. Um, and the actual video is called The Perfect Elevator Pitch, Best Examples and Templates, and it's on YouTube. Okay, so we're about to round uh, the turn toward the end on the, the third, as you called out, um, element of, of storytelling. And I, we've already talked about audience. We've talked about authenticity. So the third is action. And, you know, I've, I've said this before, uh, but I, I, it just bears repeating that if you're going to build and take the time to create all of this incredible communications content, it's only useful to you if you take action and ensure that it gets used. And a great place to start, of course, is with the people already in your inner circles. Um, some of you might have a business partner, others of you maybe, maybe have an employee, I, I'm not sure. Um, but even if you use just the colleagues here at Startup Hall or investors and others in your network um, and start, after you've crafted this messaging, start testing it out and ask people, does this hold up? Does this sound like what you know we do? Um, is there something missing? That consistency and reuse is so important because it gives you confidence that you know you've got messaging that sells and that's real um, and it also keeps others around you who are helping to represent what it is you do and what your company is about. Um, it keeps them, it gives them something to use. 
And I'm also a huge proponent of collaboration around communications. And this may not really come into play so much for you until you've grown your companies to, to where they're large enough to where collaboration really matters. Um, but you know, all the time at Spring Green, we're talking to um, with some of our clients that are quite quite massive. Um, you know, have you tested that with human resources? Did you get legal to weigh in? Um, how about the folks in external affairs and legislative affairs? Um, what do they have to say about this? Uh, just making sure that different stakeholders are given an opportunity to react and to improve upon the messaging you create. I actually have an article here that I wrote for PRSA about that very topic. If you were interested, I can send you the link for that after too. And then again, my call to action for you today is to start work on those elements of the messaging toolkit, build your own and then flight test them, put them to work. Um, as you're building them, tools that are readily available such as Editor and Word, I know it sounds kind of old school but it actually is kind of handy, um, Grammarly, and then of course generative AI tools can do all kinds of things for you. I advise using those with discretion because I would hate for you to dump in some IP and you know, not sure what's going to happen with it, but um, those things can all help shape your story for you too, even if you're just like, build me some key messages around this. Um, we've started using um, ChatGPT for things even like recapping reports uh, or, or news clips for clients. Um, something that used to take maybe forever for someone to sit down and read through and then come up with three key takeaways, they'll do that for you in a matter of seconds, and you know this already, but um, thinking about how you can apply those tools to your communications development as well. And then, as I've said, repetition is your friend. If you've already got them, then use them. Put them into your next pitch or presentation, your next meeting, um, your next LinkedIn post. Don't let these things go to waste. All right, so I'm uh, leaving you with this Im image as I imagine that that astronaut on the very first slide I showed you, um, I imagine her sort of standing in this fictitious stock image uh, spacecraft returning back home and thinking about the story that she's going to tell. Um, you have already gone on a bunch of journeys, I'm sure. Um, with that some that maybe have been daunting, others that have been a great success to lead you um, to this place that you are with your startup. And I hope you spend time reflecting on those and sharing how what you've built solves problems for your customers in an authentic way. I also want you to remember our three A's that we've discussed um, because communications done right, strategies that remember audience, authenticity, and action they have the power to convince others to join you. You are doing amazing things and your story is worth telling. So I flew through a little bit because of the video not playing and my book that I forgot, these things happen. Um, so I will um, say thank you so much for, speak, for letting me speak to you today and I will take your questions. Um, this is our team at Spring Green and we would of course love to hear from you in the future if we could ever help with your communications needs. But with that, I'm happy to take your questions and I think if you could just come to the microphone in the middle, um, that way everyone can hear you. Oh, thank you. Well, I'm curious, with some of the things you mentioned, um, do you need to be careful about changing them? Like, I imagine mission statement, you don't want to change that every week versus the value proposition you might be able to. I'm wondering if you have some thoughts on that. That is a great question. And I, I agree with the premise of the question, which is no, I don't think you want to tinker with your mission and even your value prop that often. If you do, it means what would promulgate that is a pretty massive shift in strategy that would cause you to say, oh wait, we've decided our mission is actually something other than this. Now if it's like a basic modification, happy to glad word changes, that's fine. But um, the real crux of your value prop and your mission statement really shouldn't change unless the company's headed in a different trajectory. Hi. Hi. Uh, I often work with teams that are, for lack of a better term, science first and are very focused on making sure that 
that credibility is there mm -hmm. and that they have all that. And it's often very difficult to have, to work with them to begin them down this journey towards the story. Mm -hmm. Any tips or tricks or techniques that you've used that are effective in bringing this important part of the overall picture? And is that because the, the organizations that are more science or STEM based, is that because you're thinking that they kind of don't know they have a story to tell or they're just not sure how to articulate it? Oftentimes it comes from you know, an academic or a medical or some other pursuit where there's a very specific, um, it, it, oftentimes it's the discovery that comes first and then the story about how it gets used or what what's the right usage mm. to focus on can be hard because they, well, it could be used all the different ways. Oh, and, sure. And, but also to see things in terms of a value proposition and to see things uh, in terms of telling a story can be, sometimes challenging for some founders and for some teams and wanted to know because you know you worked with Microsoft and other mm -hmm. groups that are really very technically focused you mm -hmm. know what you've used in the past has worked yeah that, that's a great question and I think you're right I think a lot of times this stuff can be seen as um, limiting or stifling because it's like well you're asking me to give you five talking points but I have 400 things to say and that's that's the whole point of the exercise um, you know people can't drink from a fire hose. You have to give them bits of information that make sense. Um, and if you can't do that, then I would argue that you are, um, you know, you, you need to go back and kind of look at, well, what are we really in the business of doing here? And how does what I provide meet a need? And maybe just going back to that basic question, like I said at the beginning, asking a whole bunch of questions of yourself. There's a lot of sort of philosophical self-examination that goes into building communications. Um, and I hear what you're saying, and we've, I've seen it before, um, in terms of, you know, well, uh, this, is, this is just too complex to put down into, into words. It's like, okay, well then no one's gonna buy it. I'm sorry, it's just, that's not gonna, no one's gonna adopt it. Like, if you can't tell me what's in it for me, what is this thing, what's in it for me, I, I don't probably need it or want it. So just sometimes it's tough love. <laughs> you have to kind of go back and say, I understand what you're saying, and that's all really fine and good, but at the end of the day, if you want to be able to bring market these, these products um, to people, you have to explain why. Thank you. Yeah. I have a question from online. Yeah. Um, it says, what if I don't have many metrics because my company is so new are there other things that I can use as evidence or claims for my message? Yes, so I would go back to sort of, you know, if you, if you have a white paper or something that you first came up with in your business plan as you were um, starting out, what are the things that motivated you to get into this line of work to provide this solution? What sort of aha moment was um, led to the innovation that you're building? And I would say that that is actually great fodder too, sort of the origin story, the early days um, that brought you through to now. And that can also help inspire the new stuff that you craft messaging wise, um, because you can, it's sort of like a reminder, oh yeah, wait, wow, we have come a long way. Look at, this is, this is one of those where the genesis of the idea, the seed of the idea, now we're here, let's talk about that journey. And then like, where, what are we gonna spring to next? Um, so for the um, elevator pitch or the short pitch, you were yeah. saying, you had to say like, I help X achieve Y by doing Z, right? So if you're, I think the X and Y, it's cool, but like the Z, I, I, it's actually like a bunch of solutions, like, you know, mm. a few different things, right, which help achieve the problem. Um, is it that my problem is too large? Is it that I just need to have a more concise way of expressing? The solution, like what do you, how do you suggest I think about it? Well, that might be a, an instance where going back to who your audience is and who you're talking to in that moment can inform what you decide to say for your Z. Um, so if you're talking to a group of people who only care about the one part of the solution, the overall solution feature, then speak to that feature. Um, if you're trying to win in, in, you know, over a, a VC, round of funding, I understand how that might not be the right answer because you do want to kind of talk about the breadth of things that you do. Um, but you can have that stuff come through in other ways too. So 
I, I think I would answer that question in the way I just did, which is to say that based on who you're talking to in the audience, be discriminating about how you fill in the Z. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I love all these questions, thank you. Um, like when we're often pitching to investors or customers, uh, especially investors will always emphasize like we look at team, team, team. And so from my perspective, they're kind of being a little bit lazy. They don't want to like actually listen to what your value proposition is or, you know, what your mission statement is. And, you know, they hear and see so many of those and they become indistinguishable mm. after a while. Yeah. And so you're sort of like, you know, trying to redirect their attention to what, you know, kind of what the company is about rather than who the people in the company are. You know, they're looking for validations of people from Google and Microsoft. So like, what are your, like, have you seen techniques to, you know, like how much of the details of the people in the company do you share? Cause like kind of what you presented is like, this is your company and this is what you're trying to achieve, but you didn't talk about the people in it. If you've got people that are notable, you would maybe talk about them. If you don't have people that are notable, you're trying to like get the investor off of team, team, team onto something else. So like, what do you put in your materials to say like, look at this, don't emphasize that even though you walked in probably trying to you know look for that thing already. Yeah, that's a great question. I, you know, people should definitely show up in things like your key messages and even as you're crafting other narratives and, uh, if I were giving a talk today just specifically on how to do a pitch presentation, I, I would spend more time on that component of team. But as I hear, if I'm hearing what you're saying correctly, you're actually wanting to pivot away just from talking about people all the time and being able to kind of put forward things like value prop and mission statement, but you're, you're hearing VCs push back on that because they really just want to see, well, who's behind this thing? Right, it's just easy, it's like easier to look at like, all right, who's on the team and where did they come from? That's digestible instantly. Mm -hmm. You know, after you've seen like 10 or 20, you know, value proposition statements, they lose their meaning. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm actually sympathetic to the predicament they have where they just, yeah, they're sure. buried in information. Yeah, especially if you're not seeming differentiated enough in those things. Um, so you might just need to lean more into team when you're talking to VCs than you would when you're presenting at um, like a jobs fair because you're wanting to recruit someone or um, speaking to a member of the media because they are going to care more about like what is this what's driving you what are you all about um, so you know I hate to keep cheating and going back to audience but um, I'm trying to think of a way I can give you a tip that would help kind of re reorient the the VCs to wanting to know more about what you're about as opposed to just who's who's with you it, it almost seems like, like you need to share some information about the team to kind of mm -hmm. get their attention, but then it's like, how do you move through that to explain why the whole company is compelling? Like, they're actually making their decisions on the wrong information. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, one way to do it might be to say, okay, here are the people that are, that are with me, and here's how I got them to buy in. I was able to demonstrate a clear value proposition, and you know, maybe you're not even being as pedantic as saying the words of mission statement value proposition, but you're bringing those elements into your deck, and you're saying this is what this was the galvanizing force for these people coming together, this mind hive being built. Like we're we're working toward this aim, and so it's a little bit less, a uh, little more subtle mm -hmm. um, than just to say value prop, mission statement, key messages. You know, right, thanks. Hope that helps. <laughs> How's it going? Um, so I w you had a slide there mentioning the uh, communicating your mission statement to the teams, your own team themselves. Do you take the same approach when coming up with that uh, communication internally or is it a different process? And like, is there more of a feedback loop to the communications teams in that process? Meaning, um, is there just a certain section of the, the group that's authoring the content and then presenting it or is it really just like let's all get together and build this thing when when you're building the company culture itself so you are you're kind of trying to communicate your message internally and have people on board but also not create a environment where it's like you toe the line and right it's that or nothing 
Yeah, the, I love this question because it's that is the rub so often is how much is this a democracy versus like, here's what it is and let's all step to it. Um, and I think it depends on your size. I think it depends on how many, um, you know, it, it, if you have a couple of founders that are partners, I would start there. Um, and then as, you know, craft the content and then ask for people to give their input to it. Um, and if you can frame the journey you took to crafting the content with enough that provides enough sort of um, validity to, we put a lot of thought into this, here were, the, here were the sources we used to build it, this is where it comes from, then there's gonna be less arrows thrown at it because you've already kind of built the case for how you created it. Um, but I do think that giving teams opportunity to give feedback is really important because you're, you're going to end up facing um, those tough questions on the outside. And so giving yourself the kind of gift of like, give me feedback now, it doesn't mean that you're obligated to take it. I mean, if it's your partner, you are, but you know, it, asking for feedback is, is simply that, it's asking for feedback. And more often than not, it will shape what you, where you land. Um, but I, I think buy-in in, internally is really important. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I wonder, kind of following up on Zach's question, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about testing your messages. I think you touched on a little bit different ways that you can get some feedback and resonate, but maybe more specific actions you've taken or things you've done with other clients to get some direct feedback um, on how those messages are resonating with your audiences. Yeah, definitely. So, um, you know, there's there's the old like A B testing where you literally kind of like put a couple of different messages up and people based on how they click or what what response rate you get or even like if you're doing a newsletter and you, you kind of come up with a couple of different subject lines and you can kind of cull data from that. But I think what you're asking about is more like how do I test these messages internally or with other key stakeholders yeah. before I kind of roll them out to the world. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I mean, going back to that kind of collaboration point I made earlier, uh, sometimes we'll craft some messaging and then um, take it to another department that's never seen it before or, you know, that works at the same place, but that doesn't, isn't in the business of, of wordsmithing. And we'll say, um, you know, here's a mark, here's something we're going to put into some marketing assets. Like, d what do you think? Like, does this sound like the company you work for? Does this sound like the direction you know we're headed? And um, it's, it's always very revelatory to hear what they have to say. Sometimes it's validating and great. And other times it's like, oh, I don't know. I think you're missing this. Um, I think, uh, you know, you can go through those really specific kind of internal exercises asking other groups for input. But I also think that um, when you're out and about, testing messages in speeches can be really helpful or in talking points because you can kind of see or hear immediate or maybe later feedback around, oh, that didn't land or that didn't equate to what I, what I know about you or I, don't, I just didn't get it. Um, so that's another place. Thank you. Yeah. I was curious, do you see very many companies engaging in this process early on and are there advantages to do that? Like I'm from software and there's the concept of user stories which help mm -hmm. figure out whether or not you should actually do the thing. Um, yeah, the persona, like the personas I had up earlier. Yes, I think um, so. It, is your is your question? Do people actually do do this, or do they do it to? Sorry, I'm not sure. I totally understand the question. I guess the question is, do you see very many people, very many companies doing doing this process early, or is it always after the fact when they've already have a product or something they're trying to sell? Yeah, I, you know, I don't know if I have a great answer to that question. I mean, I, I advocate for people to do it all the way along. We have primarily, and in the course of my career, I've worked with companies once they already are ready to go to market and they can, frankly, afford a budget to hire a, a PR agency to come alongside and like make the, help them make the thing real. Um, but I, the reason why uh, a few slides back I, I advocated for, remember when we put up um, conflict um, characters and point of view and I said start building your arsenal of stuff now like have have a file where you're just dumping things in uh, maybe it's like your early adoption rates or what you learn on the first rev of testing that you then apply to the second rev of testing 
all of that stuff is so much easier to capture real time than it is later on, like, you know, like you're pointing out, when you're ready to go and you're having to go back and remember, oh, wait, what were the kind of proof points that I wanted to call out here? What was my evidence journey? So um, more often than not, I guess I see people do it later, but if they did it sooner, it, it would be a benefit. I have another question from online. Yeah. And it is, what are some of the more impactful mediums for company storytelling? Mm. So, uh, you know, I, I just think video is so great and it's so easy now with user generated, right? And this idea that consumers don't care about the super polished video, they want real. Um, Rowena has been doing some fun stuff even with like, you know, TikTok and Continuum College and, and others. So I think you can, the, the sky is the limit. We're living in a really great time in terms of um, being able to do cheap media that is still considered credible and sometimes it's considered more credible because you're doing it yourself. Um, so I love video, especially for startups as they're being able to like show, I mean, I don't know if you guys have any rules around what you can film or not in here, but um, you know, if you're able to kind of demonstrate, hey, this is what we're working on today, we're getting ready for this pitch and da 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 da. Um, I think that kind of thing is really great about just helping demonstrate your storytelling. Um, you know, podcasts are really hot right now, and I'm not saying I'm suggesting anybody launch their own podcast, but if you could be a guest on a podcast, like, you know, there are, there are so many of them out there that, that are uh, really niche that um, finding one where you know you know you have an interesting solution to pitch. I, I love how I built it with Guy Raz and they have that whole, hey, like, you know, film your thing and send it in and maybe we'll feature you. Um, so I think just direct to getting really direct into people's um, inboxes and the way places where they're consuming information is really important. So, um our company is trying to attract a like uh, we're a B two B two C, so we're trying to attract other businesses for a pilot to participate in pilot projects. Mm. Um, so you know, reaching out to some businesses that are you know they get so many opportunities, and so you're trying to like capture attention. And so on the idea of like the media, do you, you know, we're thinking about it like a funnel. Like how do you get attention? Oh, right. They're probably not going to pay attention. You're going to follow up with something maybe related. Um, and then if you do get a response, you like have something more detailed and then something more detailed below that. So do you have any like tips on how to like prioritize your messages and then like create a funnel so that it becomes like a multi-point delivery and then you know maybe at the end of that funnel you get some you know hits. And when you say hits, do you mean like literally traffic to your website or so, yeah, traffic back saying, hey, we you know, we noticed what you're you know suggesting and we want to we want to have more information. Yeah. Um, I know we don't specialize in digital ads or digital marketing, but I know that that's a place where a, a lot of a lot of success can be found. I, I know it could be hit or miss, but um, being able to really target, going back to audience, you know, that's the gift that, that digital marketing and advertising gives you is to be hyper targeted. So um, that's one place. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm, that's an answer you're looking for. Well, but like, so you can have like a mission statement and a value proposition, mm -hmm. but you might lead with the missions or the value proposition. And then, you know, like actually last night I was writing a, like a product brochure. It's like six to eight pages, probably, you know, it's almost like a company profile yeah. booklet. Yeah, yeah. And so we're like, you know, I'm gonna use what you've, like, that's why I was taking pictures, because I'm, I'm gonna great. use what your information right away. Um, but I'm like, all right, so you have, say you write this brochure, right? Uh -huh. Like you're not gonna, you could put that in your initial email as an attachment, or you could write a shorter message and then try to follow up with that in something later. And maybe you have like a two-page version and an eight-page version. You know, like how do you create something that is, you're just trying to like get a reply. Right. Um, well, I would have to know a lot more in order to give you like a really great answer in terms of like kind of what your goals are and, and you know, just a lot, a lot more. But I would say that, um, what I hear you saying is really important, which is that you're building out different assets. And I think giving yourself the gift of um, just a brief one pager that is very succinct and kind of just leaves almost like that elevator pitch advice I gave, the audience wanting more to ask more questions, that's great to have on hand. Then you might wanna do something more robust like an impact report where you're literally detailing everything, every single thing you did in the course of that year and the impact that it drove. Um, so you need to have different, um, the toolkit is really meant to apply to the approach to creating 
all the stuff that then gets pulled into the things that you build based on who you're marketing to, what your aims are, um, if, if, it's media, if media is involved. Um, mm -hmm. So tailoring is really, I think, critical. Thanks. Yeah. Sure. Oh, great. Um, hello, Tia. Hi. Um, thanks for the great lecture. Yes. Uh, my name is Jay. I'm a YouTube student, and I'm actually a musician. And you might ask me why the musician is uh, like a startup uh, lecture. But the reason why I'm here is that I'm trying to view my music as kind of business term because yeah. technically my listeners are my customers. Mm -hmm. So to do my music marketing, um, I currently have a, about like 3,000 monthly listeners on Spotify. I'm trying to use like social media in general to promote my music. Mm -hmm. But what I wonder is how can I uh, promote my music in person and I wonder your the elevator pitch way can be used, like applied in that context? Yeah, meaning if, if you have the opportunity to be with someone who you think, who, who you want to either invest or to uh, yeah, become not? a listener, what yeah, do you yeah. say to them? So, um, so for example, like I assume like there here are how many people here? Maybe like 20 to 30 people and I believe like some of them will likely to listen to my music, but you know I cannot just simply like hey, would you like to listen to my music? I, can't, I know I can't I cannot do that. So I just wonder like how some like um, effective phrase to do it, or like how can I do it? So it sounds like appealing, you know. I just wonder how to do that. Yeah. So meaning that you, you want to be able to frame yourself in a way that you kind of initially can weed out if people are interested or not before you kind of dive in. Is that what I'm hearing you ask? Like, how do I kind of gauge if someone's interested before I just dive into, hey, I'm a musician and this is, you should listen. Okay, so you mean I need to figure out um, the potential, aud I need to distinguish the potential audience first instead of just randomly picking people, you mean? Yes. Okay. That, I think that that is, that is the first place I'd start um, to drink my own Kool Aid, as they say. Mm -hmm. um, because if you, I guess what I'm thinking of is put yourself in the right room to where you can kind of know all right, like I'm here, these people fit this you know, general demographic profile or, or listen to this kind of you know, whatever it is that mm -hmm. I'm selling that I've created. Uh, you're an artist, excuse me. Um, but so that you are confident when you kind of go around and start testing the waters around like this is who I am this is what I've got are you interested or or would you like to learn more um, so I don't know that there's some magic bullet for for vetting people's initial interest but making sure that you're in the right place to where that networking is is going to pay off for you um, but the fact that you're a musician I mean that's kind of I mean, guess I guess on the one hand it is more generalist, but it also gives you the gift of thinking most people do like music. Very few mm -hmm. people don't. Maybe they don't like. Maybe the music you create is not their first taste. But um, you're going to be in good company in terms of being able. And most people are not going to be off put by you talking about, hey, I'm a musician, and they're going to more likely than not they're going to say, that's cool. Tell me more. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for answer. Yeah, you're welcome. Hello, Hi. thank you so much. I was totally gonna say the music thing, I love when people describe uh, how their music makes people feel. Mm. Cause like there's different modalities, like there's rock, there's all this, but like my music makes you feel uplifted or healed or I don't know. I love like that. that, did you yeah. hear that? She, yeah. she should be up here. I, I love That's working with artists, so I'm, <laughs> yes. I'd love to talk to you. Um, That's great. Okay, so for my personal project, yeah, kind of a, a personal ask, so we can always take this offline. Um, part of my story, we like to talk a lot about safety and how important that is in what we're building and, and whatnot. But we know by putting that at the forefront and talking about it, we'll be very much like tested on that. Um, and I was reading your slide here in the, the crisis planning. So that's something we're talking about now. Um, it, okay, so like we did all these things, right? But there's still gonna be that Thing, that moment yes. that we need to plan for. Right. Um, so I wanted to ask you a little more about um, the crisis planning work you do and also like, yeah, connecting the dots. Like your story is so powerful and here's something you lead with in your story, but it could very much become 
your Achilles heel mm -hmm. <laughs> right at the same mm -hmm. time because you're putting it out there, being vulnerable, like trying to take something head on, but then have to plan for the worst. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, and it's and it's good that you have that mindset as too many companies don't think about crisis until it happens. And that's yeah. the first time that's that like they, been like limiting me the, the, the most in my journey is like, really? Yeah, because it's like, oh, man, I'm so passionate about this. But mm. now we need that, you know, again, positive way to think, but it's like almost uh, a, my handicap in a way, like yeah. it's hard to get past that. Yeah. I understand that. Yeah, because it, I mean, it, you are very vulnerable when you've created something and you put it out into the world. There's a vulnerability to that and mm -hmm. not knowing how it'll work out, what kind of um, unforeseen crises that might arise. Um, but I think that having the plan actually gives you the ability to sleep at night because you have faced all of those what if scenarios and you you don't know how it's necessarily gonna play out until it happens, but you know what you're prepared to say and not say, and you have a plan for the people around you that are gonna support you in that. So um, I don't know if that totally answers your question. If, was there more to it that I didn't address there in terms of? I, I'm, I'm mostly interested in like what you guys do for like crisis planners. We're definitely looking uh, to look for great, great partners on that too. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Um, my colleague, my business partner, Melissa Matthews, she's a, the, the main pro on the team for Crisis. Um, she actually, when we worked at NASA, she worked on um, the Columbia disaster uh, that happened when the space shuttle blew up on reentry um, in the Columbia Accident Investigation Board. So we have a lot of rich, ex sad experience there. But um, the crisis planning that we do um, for clients today is really around um, you know, coming up with scenarios for what might play out and then what role communications has in in managing the crisis in the moment um, what are the other players involved and how are we going to coordinate with them and make sure that we deliver um, you know the right response for our for our employees for our customers for anyone who's been impacted um, there's sometimes uh, I, I think if Melissa were here and I were channeling what she would say the biggest piece to that is um, doing running those scenarios and like testing them over time. I mean, you can't totally test them, but um, a crisis, good crisis plan should not just sit on the shelf. You should take it out a couple times a year and sort of revisit, okay, here are the steps. Here's what we said we're going to do. How will this work? Do we need to make updates? There's always, you know, things are changing at all times, be it the people at play or um, mitigating circumstances so uh, you have to really keep it fresh so that again you have that confidence that helps you sleep at night knowing okay I thought about these various scenarios and here's what I'm gonna do in response if it happens thanks yeah this is the, last question. the pressure <laughs> hi, uh, hi. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Yeah. I'm wondering um, in situations where your customer is not necessarily the population you serve, mm. so how to craft a mission statement. It seems like the mission statement is a little more expansive about what you do, but specifically value proposition, I suppose. Do you have multiple because of the people you serve is different from your customer? Well, and is that because you have a model like this gentleman where it's like B to B to C, so maybe you're selling something to someone else who then brings it to the end user is is that the scenario you're more or less about, or? basically yeah and I'm specifically a nonprofit right now okay mm -hmm. well you know I think that the answer to that is really um, you have a few different audiences and your message should always be tailored to the one that you're talking to at that time mm -hmm. um, if if you're really needing to reach the intermediary because they're the one that's going to buy the thing that you're selling or or secure, secure or support the service that you offer as a nonprofit, um, then they need to hear something that makes them want to choose you over the alternative. But they should also know what your mission, how your mission ties back to the people ultimately that will benefit from that service so that they know that you are mission oriented and especially for a nonprofit, that's so, so important. So I think it's just the notes that you hit and sort of when you hit them, but I, I think for the situation you're describing, it's even more um, of an imperative that you have that kind of layered messaging. Like, I mean, literally, you know, if you if you go through some of the comms plans we build, it's like we have 20 different personas for the audience, and we have different messages that are targeted at each. 
And it just makes it so much easier to refer to that when you do go to like craft um, a narrative for the website or build a brochure or start a, you know, an ad campaign. Um, because you're like, okay, we've already thought about this stuff. Here's the nuance of these audiences and how um, how we want to speak to them. So I'm not sure if that totally answers your question, but. No, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Great. Thank you for being here today, Tia. And from everyone at Commotion Labs, a big thank you today for you to be here and share your knowledge with our group. Happy to do it. Thank you so much. Next Friday at noon, Celestine C.C. Schnug, general partner at Boom Capital, will present Deal-making in 2024. Sign up today and we'll see you next week.